to get into our time in the Word, so I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. <laughs> All right, like I told you last week, if you're going to do it, do it. You know, you got to do it in unison and do it strong. Daniel chapter 3. All right, that's good. And we're looking at verses, at verses 16, 16 through 18. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. If you happen not to have a Bible, if you look on the screen, those verses will be behind me, and you can follow along. And today, as we continue our study in this amazing book, we're going to come to what I think is one of the most wonderful stories that we find in the Scriptures. Anyway, chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to, def to defend ourselves before you in this matter. You know, that alone, you can preach a message just on that, that these three Hebrew children <laughs> stand up before the emperor, before the king of Babylon, and they say to him, we don't have to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Father, we pray that your word will do its work in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Daniel 3 begins abruptly. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. Image. You know, the, wor the word immediately conjures up the image in the king's dream in chapter 2. We studied chapter 2 last week considering Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. A dream where he saw an enormous statue of a man which represented the coming and going of world powers. A statue that was obliterated by a rock, a rock that symbolizes the coming of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom on earth. So we can't help but wonder if there's a connection. Although Daniel made it clear that even the great kingdom of Babylon, symbolized by the gold head of the statue, even though he made it clear that Babylon would also fall, perhaps this was Nebuchadnezzar's attempt to make his head of gold era in human history as permanent as possible. You know, in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar embodies his own regime in a massive image that he requires re would receive special honor and respect. It's, it's a kind of worship of the spirit of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's act drives the story into a collision with the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. So what Nebuchadnezzar does in Babylon now throws those Hebrews, all the Jews that were there, it throws them into a collision course with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, Exodus 20 verse 3. Nebuchadnezzar demanded worship, but for God's people, the way was clear although it was costly. And friends, make no mistake about it. The spirit of Babylon that permeates our culture still calls for our worship, beginning with the worship of self. The spirit of Babylon in our society is calling for worship, beginning with the worship of self. I will live my life 
my way by my terms. There are no absolutes. I will set the absolutes for myself, for my life, for my future. You know, the Holy Spirit saw fit to preserve this episode in the Bible because he wants you and me to make the same decision that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made. Please get that. This has been preserved for us because the Holy Spirit expects every one of us, every follower of Jesus Christ, to make the same decision that was made by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Are you ready to dive into this amazing story? The the, the report contains three primary themes. The power of pressure, the obstinacy of obedience, and the flames of fellowship. First of all, the power of pressure. We find that in verses 1 through 15. Nebuchadnezzar's image was meant to dominate. It was a humongous monstrosity. The Bible says it was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. We get the impression that it bore a resemblance to Nebuchadnezzar, but because later Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego make it clear that they will neither bow to the image or serve Babylon's gods, you get the idea that while it bore resemblance, that somehow they mixed into this image some of the gods that they worshipped. Nonetheless, it was this humongous monstrosity. And the dedication service we required that all the civil service employees attend. They were to pay homage to the image upon hearing the music play. Nebuchadnezzar pulled together some musicians and he made it clear, whenever the music plays, you need to bow down and worship this image. And and he began with those who were in authority. He began with government officials. He he, he began with those that, that, that were a part of his civil service corps. Nebuchadnezzar made it clear that whoever did not bow down to the image would be thrown into a blazing furnace. Now, don't miss it. Don't miss it. No one was required to give up their deity of choice. He never said, this is the only God you get to worship. He never said, you've got to give up all your gods. He never said that. He said, whenever the music plays, you bow down and you worship This image, the image that I've made, the image that I've set up, there was no requirement to give up their deity of choice. The message was basically, come on, just burn a pinch of incense to the king, and then you can go on and you can follow your favorite religion. Nobody will question that. You know, friends, that's how some individuals treat Jesus. There are those who receive him into their lives and then they make him a part of their lives. He becomes one of the slices in the pie of their life. I want Jesus, but I want to keep living my life my way. Dear ones, that does not fly with the King of Kings. That does not fly with the Lord of Lords. You see, with Jesus, with Jesus is either all or nothing. Because, see, he cannot be Lord. There is no way that he can be Lord. He can't, if he is not Lord of all, well, then he is not Lord at all. So with Jesus, that doesn't fly. But there are people today who say they're following Christ, but yet they still dictate how their lives are going to go. Friends, and the reason I think that that happens, the reason that there are people who think they can have Jesus and keep living as they please is because there are those who are preaching a gospel that brings relief but are not preaching the gospel that leads us to repentance. See, it's not enough to find relief. We have to come to repentance. 
Nebuchadnezzar, when he heard the interpretation of his dream that every empire was going to fall, that God was going to establish a kingdom, his kingdom that would stand, in the moment he made it clear, oh, Daniel, you serve the God of gods. He experienced relief. But he did not experience repentance because in the next chapter, he is setting up an image and calling the Babylonians to worship his image. And some folks want Christ and everything else. It doesn't work that way. When Jesus said, follow me, he meant it. Follow me and me alone. That's salvation. That's redemption. That comes from a life of repentance. Now in chapter 3, Danger comes by, by way of an assault on God's revealed truth. You know, between chapters 2 and 3, the stakes get higher. In chapter 2, the Hebrew children, there was danger. Danger rose up from an occupational hazard because no one could interpret the dream until Daniel got a hold of that because no one could interpret the dream. Well, then the king said, every wise man is going to be executed. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel were in danger by virtue of being, in a sense, in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was an occupational hazard. But now everything intensifies because danger comes by way of this assault on God's revealed truth, specifically an attack on the first commandment. You will have, thou shalt have, no other God before me. So because of that, everything rises. The stakes rise. This would be a good place to mention Daniel's absence because Daniel is not a part of this episode. There's no mention of him in this account. And the thought is that he was away on king's business when all this occurred. And I believe that because there's no way that Daniel is not mentioned because somehow he compromised. My goodness, he didn't compromise in chapter 1. He didn't compromise in chapter 2. Then when we find him in the lion's den, once again, he doesn't compromise. So he's not mentioned, and I believe it's because he's out doing Nebuchadnezzar's work. So he was not there when all of this occurred. Now that's the backdrop. Now here's the pressure that these men felt. First of all, there was pressure from authority. Read it when you go home in verses 1 through 7. Reread the phrase, Nebuchadnezzar the king. We read that phrase repeatedly. It's as if the king's authority is being overstressed. Everyone felt the sheer weight of Nebuchadnezzar himself. There was this pressure because he was saying, you've got to bow to my image. The king was saying that. There was pressure from conformity. People were gathered, they were instructed, they were threatened. And according to what I read, the band played and down they went. Backsides in the air, noses in the ground. Friend, there is an amazing amount of pressure that comes when you're among a whole mass of people who are now on the ground worshiping and you're standing. I mean, if everyone else is bowing and and you're not, you are literally, literally a standout in the crowd. Are you ready? Are we ready to be a standout in our society? That when others begin to bow the knee to the spirit of Babylon, we remain standing? Are we ready to be a standout in our society? I love, I love what my wife Sandy told my daughter Dianza when she went away to school at University of Michigan. And she said, Dianza, remember, only dead fish go with the flow. Only dead fish go with the flow. You have to be constantly, constantly swimming upstream. Swimming upstream with Jesus. Friends, please remember that. Only dead fish go with the flow. When it comes to this society, only believers, believers have to continually swim against the current. Friends, these men felt pressure from authority. They felt pressure from conformity. Next, they felt pressure from malice. 
The Bible tells us that soon after the musicians played and, and the people dropped to the ground, certain astrologers went to Nebuchadnezzar, some of the wise men, and they let him know that there were certain Jews, that there were certain Jews who were defying the king in their refusal to bow. And quickly, they identified those Jews as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those accusations were prompted by envy. How do I know that? Because when they came to Nebuchadnezzar, here's what they said. There were certain Jews that you put in charge over some of the provinces of Babylon. You know what they were saying. I wanted that job. There are certain Jews that you put in authority over certain provinces in Babylon, and they refused to bow. Now, here's my question. They say certain Jews, then they name Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Weren't there other Jews in Babylon? Where were they? On the ground. On the ground. There are certain Jews that are defying you. Friends, they felt that pressure of malice. People who were coming against them. And then these three also felt the pressure from intimidation. You know, angry kings leverage a certain amount of fear. And all the more when three words are added, burning, fiery, furnace. Come on, friends. I think you'd agree. I think you'd agree that the prospect of being roasted to death tends to motivate. Come on. The idea of being roasted to death, I think, tends to, to motivate, tends to mobilize. In light of all of this, I think we can appreciate the pressure being faced by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, before moving forward, I, I want us to look again at verses 1 through 15. And again, read this when you go home again and, 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 and consider how pressure can be deflated. Because you see, in those verses, the writer introduces us to all that I just mentioned, the image that Nebuchadnezzar created, the demand for worship, the intimidation, the threat of death if there isn't compliance. But then when we look a little closer at those verses, we notice that the writer is employing a subtle level, just a subtle level of sarcasm in the account. The writer repeatedly, repeatedly tells the reader that Nebuchadnezzar made the image. He says at least eight times, at least eight times he tells us, and Nebuchadnezzar set up, he set up, he set up this image. Friends, he's telling us, he is asking us, can you see how asinine this is? Can you see the total stupidity in this? That there is a man, a human, who has made something with his own hands, and he's calling it divine. He's calling it something supernatural. But he made it with his own hands. Dear ones, the subtle message from Daniel is this. Yes, this is a fearful trial. I don't take anything away from it. This is a fearful trial. But can you also see that it's a farce? A God that's made by man? An image that has been set up? And then there's the demand to worship it? Dear ones, the Holy Spirit is preparing us for life in the last days. The Holy Spirit is preparing us for life in the last days. Pastor, do you really think that we're living in the last days? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And the Holy Spirit is preparing us for life in the last days. Well, Pastor Cal, what if these aren't the last days? Well, friends, let me tell you something I've told you before. These are the last days for us. What if this isn't the last generation? It's our last generation. And the 
Holy Spirit is preparing us. Friends, we will experience an increase in pressure. Pressure to break loyalty with our Savior and our Master, Jesus Christ. Here's what you and I have to remember. Jesus is the truth. And anyone or anything that opposes him is a lie. Jesus is the truth. And anything and anyone that opposes him is a lie. Friends, right there, that deflates pressure. Daniel is reminding us, listen, this is a, this is a fearful situation that my friends were in. But let, let, let's show the lie. The image is not supernatural. The image is not divine. It's a lie. The truth is that the commandment that they're standing for, I will have no other God before me, that's the truth. Friends, for us, Jesus is the truth. Hear me again. Anything, young people, listen to me. Anything, anyone that opposes Jesus Christ is a lie. It's a lie. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the life. And friends, that may not remove all the terror of a situation that the enemy might design, but at least we can know there's no truth in what he's designed. And that will enable us to endure. This would enable the group of Egyptian Christians to remain true to Christ when facing execution. It happened a year ago, February, when 21 Egyptian Christians were let out on, an, on a beach by members of ISIS and then listen to the words coming from both groups. Each somber Christian kneeled before a hooded terrorist. Each executioner gripped the prisoner's shoulder with one hand while clutching a knife in the other. ISIS had labeled these men people of the cross, followers of the hostile Egyptian church. One of the terrorists then unleashed a rambling diatribe that ended with these words, O oh, crusaders, safety for you will only be wishes. Safety for you will only be wishes. And as he said that, the executioners placed their knives against the necks of their captives. The victims, and the videotape went out, the victims were calm. No outbursts, no cries. Instead, Every man looked to the sky and said these words, My Lord Jesus. My Lord Jesus. Reminds me, reminds me of Stephen when the Pharisees went crazy, when he made it clear, you've crucified him. You crucified the Messiah. And they went crazy with anger. And they began to throw stones at that man. And the Bible says that Stephen looked into the heavens and he says, I see the Son of God standing, standing by the throne of God. My Lord Jesus. The lie? O oh, crusaders, safety for you will only be wishes. The response from the Christians? My Lord Jesus. Friends, they testified of the reality of the truth of Christ with their last breath on earth and entered eternity singing praises, singing praises to the king, to the king who they lifted in defiance to those terrorists. 
2. The obstinacy of obedience, verses 16 through 18. Hey, if you're going to be obstinate, if you're going to be stubborn, be stubborn about your obedience. Every parent should have said amen, right? That was your chance. That was your chance. Having received the report from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they refused to bow to his image, Nebuchadnezzar brought them before him. And he asked them, is that report true? Is it true? And then he gave them a chance to exonerate themselves. And he said to them, listen to me. Here's my chance. Here's an opportunity. They're going to play those horns. They're going to play their music. But if you do not bow at the sound of the music to the furnace, you will go. When the three men answered the king, they so much as said this, you may want to save yourself the course of the orchestra because we're not dancing. It's not going to happen. Friends, that's obstinacy. That's the stubbornness of obedience. We need some of that. Good grief. Some of us are stubborn for some really goofy things. We need to be stubborn when it comes to our obedience because Jesus told me I will not be moved. We need to be obstinate when it comes to the obedience of Jesus Christ. God, I'm going to obey you. I'm submitted to you. You're my king. That's how I'll live. That's how I'll die. Somebody say something. We need to be obstinate when it comes to our obedience. Man, the king is giving them a second chance. Can you imagine if those that are hearing about this, some of the things that they probably wanted to say to Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego probably sound like this. Why not, well, why not behave like this? Why don't you do this? Just engage. Just engage in a moment of silence. Treat it like an empty ritual. It doesn't mean anything. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it publicly. Do it in your official capacity while privately, personally, you'll oppose it. Friends, obviously, that seemed to work for some of the Jews in Babylon. And come on, let's be realists. It works for people today. I'll just do this in my official capacity. I'll just do this in the public square. But I don't really believe it. Privately, I'm opposed to it. Well, those men refused, refused to live by a dichotomy, that somehow their public life would not match their private life. They were determined, my public life will match my private life. And if I oppose this privately, I'm going to oppose this publicly. And if I will not bow the knee to another God in my private moments with him, how dare I deny him? I won't do it. They refused to do it. There would be no compromise. They would not bow to anyone but the one true God. And it's here that they give that classic answer to Nebuchadnezzar. We, we read it earlier in verses 16 through 17. And they replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. The answer from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego focuses on the ability and the pleasure of God. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. He is able to save us from it. But even, even if he does not, See, friends, the answer expresses that the three men are sure of God's ability. He is able to save us. They are sure of his ability. But they're not sure. They don't have clarity concerning his purpose for that moment. Our God is able. He has the ability to save us. But even if he doesn't, see, they, they're sure that he can save them. But they're 
that it's not clear yet. God's purposes for that moment are, are not clear. So they say, but if not, they're sure of his ability, but they're not sure of his purpose for them in that matter. It's as if they're saying to Nebuchadnezzar, listen, we don't know what our God will do, O king. You may turn us into puddles of carbon, but in one sense, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is that we will not serve your gods or worship your image. See, they weren't sure of God's circumstantial will. They weren't sure about what he would do in that moment, but they were sure of God's revealed will. You shall not have any other gods before me. He's able, but if he doesn't, we're still not going to serve your gods. We're still not going to worship your image. Friends, it was his revealed will, his revealed will that dictated their actions. Or if we can learn that. That it's his revealed will that must dictate our actions. Please notice how these three men did not lose sight of the crucial matter. And what matters for them is not deliverance, but obedience. What matters to them was not deliverance, but obedience. He's able. But if he doesn't, we're still not doing this. The critical issue for them was obedience, not deliverance. The critical issue for them was worship and not safety. We're not going to do this. We're not going to worship his image. We're not doing it. We can only worship the one true God. Their issue was not safety. It was worship. Friends, these, these men give us a full balanced picture of faith. Faith knows the power of God. He is able. Faith knows the power of God. He is able. Faith guards the freedom of God. But if not, it guards the freedom of God, but if not, and faith holds the truth of God, we will not serve your gods. We will not worship that image. You know, there are those who would disagree. And there are those that in their view of faith, it involves being absolutely sure of God's ways all the time. That kind of faith is uh, allergic to any uncertainty of details. You know, if, if some folks, I think if some folks like, that think that way could rewrite the Bible, they would probably rewrite this chapter and, and they would have the three Hebrew children make this declaration. Nebuchadnezzar, we are going to call down God's deliverance right now and what's more, we bind the flames in that furnace. Well, friends, biblical faith doesn't always work like that. Doesn't always work like that. Biblical faith does not predict God's ways. It simply holds God's word. Biblical faith does not predict His ways. His ways, it just holds His word. And in the case of chapter 3 is Exodus 23. You will have no other gods before me. Biblical faith obeys God's truth. It doesn't attempt to manipulate God's hands. Biblical faith obeys God's truth. It does not attempt to manipulate God's hands. And biblical faith is not required to plot God's course, but only to obey God's commands. Friends, you know, in this account, faith's finest hour may be when Nebuchadnezzar uses those three words in the King James Version, burning, fiery furnace, 
And then those three words are opposed by these three words, but if not. That's what you're going to face if you don't do this. He can deliver me, but if not, we're still not doing that. We're still not doing that. You know, friends, I really believe, and, and we know how the story ends, but I really believe that the miracle of Daniel 3 has already taken place. I believe that the miracle has taken place before their deliverance by, but by, by the fact that they stood, they stood before Nebuchadnezzar in a totalitarian state, and they make it clear, listen to us, he can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not doing this. We're not doing it. We're not worshiping you. We can only worship one God. Friends, the miracle has already taken place, and, I, and I've got to believe that because just suppose, just suppose the fiery furnace had consumed them. If it had consumed them, the miracle already happened. Even if this happens, even if he doesn't get us out of this, we won't bow. And they didn't. The miracle had already taken place. But that said... We know that the fiery furnace did not consume them. The flames of fellowship. You know, after their confession, Nebuchadnezzar is so angry that he orders that the furnace be made seven times hotter. Then he orders that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be tied up and thrown into that furnace. That furnace is so hot that the Bible says when the soldiers got close to throw them into the furnace, that the flames came out and the soldiers were consumed. After a while, Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace and he's amazed. Here's what the Bible says. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, O, o King. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. The King James Version. The fourth looks like the son of God. Now, now he doesn't know whether that is the son of God or not. He just knows there's somebody divine in that furnace with those three guys, and they are walking around. I threw them in there, tied up. They are walking around untied and unharmed. Well, he should be amazed. Now, the text doesn't tell us doesn't tell us conclusively who that fourth man is. But based <laughs> on his activity throughout the Scriptures, of course in the New Testament and in different instances in the Old Testament, based on his activity, Bible scholars, Bible teachers, and preachers agree on the identity of this fourth man. And having said that, I don't think anyone answers the question of who this fourth man is more powerfully than one of the great evangelists of the 20th century, Oral Robinson. I remember, I was a freshman. I was a freshman at ORU, and back in those days, Oral Roberts would be on campus all the time, and I'd always feel like there was like a prophet from the Old Testament walking around with us. It was just an amazing situation, and, and he would preach. He would preach in chapels, he, and he, he would preach, and then he would open, the, he would open up for Q&A. Can you imagine that? As, as a freshman, being able to, you can ask Oral Roberts questions. And he preached this message, and as a freshman, I was spellbound. Little did I know that it was one of the great classic sermons that all robbers had preached decades before that. And friends, what I'm going to read to you this morning, he didn't read. It just rolled off his tongue. It just flowed. And he asked the question, who is this fourth man? In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, our high priest. In Numbers, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, the captain of our salvation. In Judges, our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, our kinsman redeemer. 
in First and Second Samuel, our trusted prophet, and Second King, Second First and Kings and Chronicles, our reigning king, in Ezra, our faithful scribe, in Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the broken down walls of our human life, in Esther, our Mordecai, in Job, our ever loving redeemer. In Psalms, he's the Lord, our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, the righteous branch. In Lamentations, the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, the fourth man in the furnace. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, our burden bearer. In Obadiah, the mighty to serve. In Jonah, our great missionary. In Nahum, the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, God's evangelist, crying, Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In Zephaniah, the Savior. In Haggai, the owner of the gold and silver in the earth. In Zechariah, the fountain that's opened up for the cleansing of sin. In Malachi, the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, the wonder worker, in Luke, the son of man, in John, the son of God, in Acts, the one who confirms the word with signs and wonders, in Romans, he's the one who makes everything work together for the good of those who love the Lord, in First and Second Corinthians, he is the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, and in Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, the God who supplies all our needs according to his riches and glory. In Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In First and Second Thessalonians, our soon coming king. In First and Second Timothy, our mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's our faithful pastor. In Philemon, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's the great physician. In First and Second Peter, our chief shepherd who soon shall appear. In First and Second John, he's everlasting love. In Jude, he's Lord, coming with ten thousands of his saints. And in Revelation, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Then he asked the question, who is the fourth man? He is Abel's sacrifice, Noah's rainbow, Abraham's reign, Isaac's well, Jacob's ladder, Samuel's horn of oil, David's slingshot, Hezekiah's sundial, Daniel's visions, Amos' burden, Malachi's son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And he asks again, who is the fourth man? He's Peter's shadow, Stephen's signs and wonders, Paul's handkerchief and aprons, and John's pearly white gates. Who is, who is the fourth man? He is the father of the orphan and the husband to the widow. To the traveler in the night, he's light. He's bright. He's the morning star. To those who walk in lonesome valleys, he's the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, the staff of life, the honey and the rock. He he is the brightness of God's glory, the, the expansive image of his person, the king of glory, the pearl of great price, the rock in a weary land, the cup that runneth over, my rod and my staff, and the government of our lives will be on his shoulder. Who is the fourth man? He is Jesus. He is Jesus of Nazareth. He is our king of kings. He is our Lord of lords. He is the one who is forever committed to us. He is forever committed to us. Who is that? Who is that with those four men? It's the Son of God. Who is it that's with us? It's the Son of God. Jesus is fully committed to us. So when the spirit of Babylon, when the spirit of Babylon rises up and says, you've got to worship this, you've got to worship that, we need to declare, you can do what you want, but I can only worship, I can only worship my Savior, my Redeemer, my King, my Lord. I can only worship Jesus. I will only worship Jesus. Listen, forget the PowerPoint. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were here today, they would say to us, listen to me, you have got to, you have got to get to the place where you say, listen, I will not bow the knee to anyone but Jesus, even, even if it kills me, even if it kills me. We have got to. That's it. We're done. No idols. That's it. No other God. That's it. No spirit of this society. I can only bow down to Jesus, my Savior. My king, my goodness, 
He died to set us free. Who else? Who else warrants our worship? Who else deserves our praise? Dear ones, hear me, please. Why would we hold anything back from the Lord Jesus Christ? Friends, please, let's get it. Let's get it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made it clear. We can't do this. We won't do this. It's not happening. Those guys were living pre-cross. They were living pre-cross. They were living under the Old Testament law. They were still offering sacrifices in a temple to a holy God that they could not touch. But that day in the furnace, here I am, <laughs> here I am, here I am, the one that you've been standing for, the one that you've been trusting in, the one that you've been confident in. Oh, people of God, we live, we live post-cross. We live post-resurrection. Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus has torn. He's torn. He's taken away that middle wall of partition. We have access to this holy God. Why would we worship anything else? And here's another one. Why would we hold anything back from him? Anything. Anything. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to get ready to close, come to communion. The story goes like this. It was during the days of the Soviet Union. And from time to time, the party would send out KGB agents to see what was happening across the land, doing their best to snuff out Christianity, to take away any confidence in any other God but the party, the party. On a particular Sunday, a KGB agent walked into a church, saw an old lady. She was knelt down by a carved image of Jesus on the cross. She was just cradling his feet, kissing the feet of that carved image of Christ on the cross. KGB agent got close to her, said, Babushka, Grandma, would you be willing, would you be just as willing to kiss the feet of our most honored secretary of the party? And she shot back, absolutely. Just crucify him first. Are you willing to compromise your life in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Crucify him first. Would you, crucify, would you compromise for a person? Crucify, get crucified for my sin. Would you compromise for a title? Fine. Get crucified for my sin. Would you compromise for popularity? Fine. Just be crucified for my sin. Because until that happens... My allegiance belongs to one. There's only one that's been crucified for my sin. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And dear ones, we need to get to that place. We need to encourage each other to stay in that place. Period. It's a good time to come to the table.